Sonic, the heart of your system. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGu, and over the last couple of months we've had two major launches from both Intel and Nvidia. This PC sitting beside me, the Asus ROG Strix GL12CX, a very catchy name I must say, is actually the first PC that combines both Intel's 9th gen CPUs with Nvidia's RTX graphics. So the spec actually includes the i9-9900K CPU, there's also an RTX 2080 that sits alongside 32GB of DDR4 memory at 26 66 megahertz. There's a 512 gigabyte SM961 SSD as well as a 2 terabyte hard drive and rounding that off we have a Z390 motherboard with a 700 watt 8 plus gold power supply. So starting with the outside of the case you can definitely tell it's a gaming PC. The front panel's got those kind of ridged bump sections that's all a bit angular though I would say it's not nearly as outlandish as something like the MSI Aegis 3 which I reviewed about a month ago. That was a you know a very out there case, very aggressive design. The GL12CX is definitely a gaming PC, but it doesn't kind of stand out in quite the same bold and aggressive way. Keeping with the front panel, at the top we find four USB ports. There are two USB 2 and two USB 3.1 Gen 1, and that sits alongside actually an SD card reader, which is a good inclusion, as well as a headphone jack. Just below that, would you believe it, we actually find an optical disc, just if you want to put in any CDs or you have any physical games lying around. But more interesting actually is below that is there's a kind of what looks like an empty bay, and no, it's not actually for a floppy drive. This is actually Asus's 2.5 inch hot swap bay. So this simply lets you install a SSD or 2.5 inch hard drive into the included caddy, and then you can simply plug that into the little bay, and that gives you a hot swap 2.5 inch drive bay. So you just pop it in, it will show up in Windows, and then you can just pull it out again, and it will disconnect in Windows. No reboot of the system required whatsoever. Asus says this is meant for eSports, but I'm not entirely sure about that, but I certainly do think it's a good feature. At the very least, it lets you add extra storage if you want to in an easy way, or you could also use it to quickly transfer large files. Maybe you're transferring files from one game library to another. Whatever it may be, I think it's a good inclusion. Now, round the back of the system, we again find quite a plentiful I.O. There's actually eight USB ports here. There are two USB 2s again, but there's actually four USB 3 Gen 1, and there's another two USB 3.1 Gen 2. Looking now at the side of the case, you can see here, just for the purposes of this video, I haven't got a side panel on, but you can actually get a choice of two side panels in the box. By default, this kind of black metal one is included, which looks quite plain. And while a clear acrylic panel is included in the box, in a moment we're going to get to the reasons why I decided to stick with that solid black side panel. So now turning to the inside of the case, you obviously get a look at all of the hardware here, but I think the first thing that stands out is probably this big bar that goes right across the midsection of the case. So this is actually what Asus calls its VGA crossbar, and it's essentially a bracket to support the included graphics card. So that stops it getting bumped around or damaged in shipping, and it also helps prevent any unwanted GPU sag. It's attached using five screws, and if we remove those, we actually get a look at the graphics card itself, which is the Asus RTX 2080 Turbo, which is a blower style card from Asus. Moving on now to the CPU and the cooler. The cooler itself is actually a modified Cooler Master Master Liquid 120 Pro. So that's 120 millimeter all in one. And you can see it's been modified to have the Asus ROG logo on the top of the cold plate. Although sadly that is not RGB, which I think would have looked very, very cool. So that liquid cooler exhausts air through the roof and there's also a 120 millimeter fan at the front which is, acts as an intake. And actually the fan at the back, which is a 90 millimeter fan, that is also set to intake, which is quite unconventional. Usually we'd have front intake, roof and rear exhaust. We'll get to detailed thermals later on in the review, but I did actually find that the CPU ran two degrees hotter if I flipped the fan around. So it was actually cooler in its default configuration with the rear fan acting as intake. The reason for that being, I would suggest, is the fact that the single intake fan at the front is positioned quite low down, so it's feeding more of the GPU rather than the CPU, so that means there isn't really much fresh air getting to the CPU and motherboard area of the case. 
Thus, by having this 90mm fan at the back, sending cool air over the VRM and then up to the fan in the liquid cooler, that does seem to help matters and it performed better that way. Sitting just to the right of the cooler, this motherboard, which uh, incidentally this motherboard is a bespoke unit, it's not actually an off-the-shelf motherboard from Asus's ROG line or anything like that, it seems to have been custom made for the GL12CX. So just to the right of this cooler on this motherboard we find two DIMM slots, only two, and these are both occupied by 16 gigabyte modules, which are 2666 megahertz each. That in itself is fine. 32 gigabytes is more than enough for a gaming PC in my opinion. And while 2666 megahertz memory isn't the fastest out there, on an Intel platform, it doesn't make nearly as much difference as it would for Ryzen, for instance, and as we'll see later, benchmarks are absolutely fine. What bothers me most, though, is the fact that Asus has actually gone with these kind of ugly, bare PCB green modules. So they've not got any heat spread or anything like that, no paint, it's just ugly, plain, green PCB modules, and I have to say, for a PC like this, considering the rest of the spec, and considering this PC actually costs 3,000 pounds, I think it really sticks out, it doesn't look good, it doesn't really fit in with the higher nature of the rest of the build, so I have to say I really think Asus could have done a better job at least going with some you know, basic black heat spreaders on the memory. There is a third slot next to the memory however, though this does not house another memory module, in fact this is for the DIMM.2 module. You might have already seen the DIMM.2 module, it's been a feature I think of on Asus's most recent high-end motherboards, it's essentially a M.2 riser card. So once you pull it out of the system, it's this kind of metal casing. You can unscrew that and it reveals two M.2 slots. In this system already, one of them is occupied by the 512 gigabyte Samsung SM961, which is roughly the OEM equivalent of the 960 Pro, which is a good drive. It has been superseded now, but it's still a quick drive, so good to have it in this system. And on the other side of that, it's actually empty. So not only does that mean the DIMM.2 is both easily accessible, because you can just quickly pull it out, it's a very easy way to add an extra SSD to the GL12CX. If you did want to add some more storage other than that, there is a 2.5 inch drive slot just above the PSU shroud, and there's also space for another 3.5 inch hard drive around the back in the drive cage, but we will get to that shortly. Coming now to the elephant in the room, I'm sure because I've not spoken about it yet, plenty of you have probably already left a comment about it, but I really have to say the cabling is absolutely hideous. I have absolutely no idea why Asus has gone with this horrible kind of ketchup and mustard cables. Considering this is a 3000 PC, we have to expect all black at the very least. For that price, really, I think the cable should be braided to give it that extra premium feel. But I have absolutely no idea why Asus has gone for the really ugly, uh, kind of just stands out, looks horrible, kind of kills the look of the PC in my opinion. I don't want to seem too harsh about it, but I think when you're spending this much money, you really would expect something a lot better looking and a lot more premium. So that cabling as well as the plain green memory modules, the front I.O. cables at the bottom as well are also a little bit messy. Those kind of reasons built up for me and that's why I didn't really want to put the acrylic side panel on and in the end I just stuck with the solid black panel. Round the back of the system as well, it is more ketchup and mustard hell. Really the only saving grace here is the fact that it's got a solid side panel anyway so you're not going to be able to see it but you will still know it's there and it is likely to be the stuff that's going to haunt your dreams. I would say though, even though you can't see it once the side panel is on, it does seem to be obscuring the bottom left drive cage. That would make it quite tricky because all the cables are bunched up, so it'd be quite hard to add in a secondary hard drive down the line. So that is one thing I think Asus could have done better, aside from the fact that the cables themselves are that horrible ketchup and mustard access to the drive cage could potentially be tricky. Now the last thing to touch on before moving on is the RGB lighting and I think from the front it looks quite good. There's these two kind of LED strips in the front panel of the case and this is all configurable using Asus Aura so the front panel looks good. The inside of the case though I think the overall effect is a bit underwhelming, it's not very bright. It could do with using another one or two RGB strips just to give it a bit more brightness and kind of cover the whole of the insides. As it is, I think it doesn't really look amazing and it's perhaps another reason just to stick with the solid black side panel. Moving now on to performance, obviously we can expect good things from the 9900K as well as the RTX 2080. It is worth saying for all of our testing we use the turbo mode that is selectable within Asus Armor Crate which is a piece of software 
which lets you choose between different profiles. We chose Turbo because not only does it run the CPU at 4.9 gigahertz, which is a small factory overclock, but it also does have a slightly more aggressive fan curve, which could help keep the thermals down for our GPU, thus keeping frame rates high. So starting with the performance, we're going to look at Cinebench first, and obviously we can see the slight overclock on the CPU, as well as the 8 core 16 threads really helps the Cinebench score, and we can also see the physics and CPU scores in 3D Mark are again very, very good. The Asus RTX 2080 card used in here is a reference clock model, so it's not quite as fast as aftermarket cards we'd see from Asus's own 2080 Strix for instance, but again it's still a 2080 and thus provides very good frame rates, especially at 1440p where it'd be great to use with a high refresh rate monitor, and even at 4k you're looking around the 50fps mark on average. So in a nutshell, the GL12CX is as fast as we'd expect from a PC that has two of the newest pieces of hardware inside, and you can be sure that this would last you a good few years before you need to upgrade. Moving on to thermals now, I'll put the chart up for you so you can see all the different results. Starting with the GPU, as it is a blower style card, we saw it peak at 83C, whether that was in gaming or in IDA64. So it is relatively warm, but it's a pretty standard result for a blower style card like this one. And considering that frequency was around the 1740 MHz mark, it is still a decent result. More interestingly though, if we look at the CPU temperatures, we can see that the peak temperatures actually varied quite dramatically depending on the different load that we tested. For example, in games, it didn't actually go past 53C and that was playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider, so that's a good result, but then in IDA64, we stressed it and we saw the CPU get to 74C. 10 runs of Cinebench though got the CPU actually up to 89C, which is definitely getting a bit toasty, but this is the most interesting and definitely the most concerning one. When I used Prime95 version 26.6, which incidentally is not an AVX workload, that actually saw the CPU peak at over 100C at 103 degrees. Now obviously this is a crazy high temperature and I would not want my CPU running at over 100 degrees at all, not, not whatsoever. Uh, and actually part of the problem is that with these new 9th gen CPUs, while TJ Maxx is still 100C, according to Asus, manufacturers actually have the option to raise TJ Maxx for the i9 up to 115 degrees. So in the BIOS, that's actually configurable by a simple uh, toggle option. It says set uh, CPU maximum temperature 115 or 100, and with this system it's on 115 by default, which is quite mind-boggling really. Obviously the reason for this is to keep performance as high as possible without the CPU throttling and accordingly we did actually see the CPU running at 4.9 GHz while at 103 degrees in Prime95 which is just crazy. I definitely think though if Asus wanted to keep performance as high as possible, surely the best option is to go with a 240mm liquid cooler instead of the 120mm unit here and not pushing up TJ Maxx to 115C. Seeing a CPU temperature over 100C is just crazy and I think that's really quite concerning and if you do buy a system like this and you see the CPU temperature over 100C, I bet you'd be very concerned as well. As we already mentioned, gaming we didn't see the CPU get above 53C, so that is not a problem whatsoever. However, just the simple fact that this CPU is going to run over 100 degrees, and that's a setting Asus has enabled by default, is surely the thing that worries me most about the GL12CX. As for noise testing as well, I use both turbo and balance profiles. As I mentioned, turbo does have a slightly more aggressive fan curve. But in the end, there's actually not really much between the two, maybe about two decibels. So in games, it would be around the 50, 51 decibel mark, which is fine. It's audible, but it's not that loud. The thing I noticed though was the more you stress the CPU, the louder this machine got. So those 10 Cinebench runs we mentioned, that would actually get it over 60 decibels. And at that point, it really did sound like a jet engine was about to take off right beside me. So it really comes down to your workload. If you're a gamer, it's not going to bother you that much, you know, like I said, audible, but not really that loud in the grand scheme of things. If you are going to be doing some heavy editing or rendering on this PC though, you are really going to start to notice the noise and it is likely to be quite annoying. Lastly, we should mention power consumption. This peaked at just over 350 watts running IDA64 on both the CPU and GPU, and in games it was about 20 watts less at the 330 watt mark. So considering it's got a 700 watt power supply in there anyway, which is 80 plus gold, that means it's only operating about 50% load, which ensures peak efficiency, and so is nothing to worry about whatsoever. 
So in a nutshell, the Asus ROG Strix GL12CX, it's a fast PC that combines both of the latest releases from Intel and Nvidia. Obviously the RTX 2080 is going to appeal to gamers, it provides enough power for 1440p gaming at high refresh rate or even 4K gaming at around the 50 FPS mark as well as that octa-core i9-9900K which at 4.9 GHz does provide enough grunt for any heavy workloads like video editing or rendering to be done on this machine. Priced at £3,000 however, I have to say this machine is very expensive for what you get. I appreciate there are actually some good features in this system like the Dim Dock 2 as well as the 2.5 inch hot swap drive, I like both of those things. But I actually priced up a very similar system with the same core components for £800 less than the GL12CX. Now usually we'd expect to pay maybe £200 or £300 extra over the cost of the components for a pre-built system. That's considering it is after all being shipped to you, it's being built for you and it's being covered by a warranty. But at £800 over the cost of the component price, I think the GL12CX is very expensive for what you get. And so overall, while I can appreciate this is of course a very fast machine, there is more to it than just the 9900K and the 2080. And so to justify the £3,000 asking price that Asus is charging, I really do think this machine as a whole just needs to be much more refined than it currently is. So I'm Dominic for Kitgiru. This has been our review of the Asus ROG Strix GL12CX. You can leave us a comment below. Let us know what you think. I know many of our readers probably build their own systems, but if you're looking to go for a pre-built, would this one from Asus appeal to you? Or what do you think of the pricing? Is it just too much for what you get in terms of the hardware? You can also subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified about all of our future videos. We've got more systems and more RTX cards as well coming very, very soon. But until then, I will see you in the next video.